Welcome to the Australian Institute of Architects. My name's Michael Linke and I'm the General Manager of Membership here in Melbourne. And thanks very much for joining us at this critically important session on interacting with clients and community after trauma. These sessions constitute part of our response to the unprecedented recent bushfires which we've seen affect Australia. But what is emerging is the fact that they're equally applicable to other situations we're currently facing, including the significant disruption that the COVID-19 pandemic is having on our society. So whether it's bushfires or whether it's COVID-19, none of us are immune to the devastating impact that this is having across Australia and the world. This seminar forms a set within the Building Back Better series, recently held in Sydney. So these sessions address interpersonal communications and process management between the architect and the client after a traumatic event. It also explores how disasters disrupt many aspects of community life, warping individual perspectives and our collective needs. So the main themes to be covered today are the effects of trauma on the mind, the characteristics of continuing stress and anxiety, how to recognise and interact with someone in a state of high arousal, how architects may be best helped to help communities recover after disasters and how it differs from daily normal circumstances, and personal qualities to, uh, to help communities recover. And that's what we'll be covering in today's sessions. We're very pleased to have two leading experts in this, in this uh, area today. I'd like to thank Jenny very much for her presentation. And I'm equally excited to welcome Rob Gordon to the stage shortly. Rob is a clinical psychologist who conducts a private psychotherapy practice in Box Hill here in Melbourne. Rob has specialism of treatment of trauma and recovery of communities from disasters. And Rob commenced working in this field in 1983 in the Ash Wednesday bushfires. And since then has observed many communities in many different types of natural and human caused events, ranging from bushfires and floods, cyclones, earthquakes, the Queen Street and Port Arthur shootings, the Bali bombings, the East Asia tsunami, the Christchurch earthquake and so on. Rob has researched the psychological effects of the stresses that follow personal and community trauma and their effects on communication and decision making. Rob is a consultant with the Red Cross Emergency Services and we're very fortunate to be able to welcome him to the stage today. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rob Gordon. Well, uh, hello everybody and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you about this very important subject. What I want to share with you is some of the learnings I've made from the state of mind, the stress state that people go into after a disaster. I think it's a very important thing to understand because what we find time and again is that actually the uh, recovery process really only begins when people can look ahead to the future they want to have. To begin with, the focus is on the physical destruction and what's been lost and the impulse, not only for the people who've suffered the damage, but right through the system to the politicians, the policy makers, uh, the local government and so on, is to replace what's been lost. But as Jenny pointed out, there's a creative opportunity here with the disaster to create something new. And many people will find that they simply can't go back to the life they had before. They slowly come to realise that the disaster is a watershed experience, that life flows in a different direction afterwards. They can't regain the goals and plans and hopes they had before. So they have to actually ask themselves, what can I expect? Now, that's a creative frame of mind. And what I want to emphasize is the stress state that is created by the disaster is incompatible with that kind of creative thinking. I haven't got time to go into it today, but I think there are three main responses to disaster psychologically. One is the trauma that Janice mentioned, which is the threatening bad experience you have on the day that reverberates on and prevents you letting it sink into the past. The second one is loss, which of course causes grief. 
including the grief of solastalgia, not to mention the grief of possessions and uh, things that are part of our history. So there is a lot of grief, much of it not clearly defined. But the third one is disruption, the disruption to the ordered patterns and routines of life, which is so important for creating stability and security. And what we see is that when the disruption and disorder of uh, life circumstances occurs, people actually have a lot of trouble thinking clearly, making decisions, understanding their priorities. What they actually find is that actually our thinking and our ability to manage things is framed by the ordered routines of our social life. Normally we don't observe that because they're all relatively stable. Now all of these factors put the person into a state of generalised stress and that state of stress I think is essential to understand when you're speaking with anyone involved in the disaster and that means anyone because the stress is contaminating. We've been observing in our communities at the moment haven't we that with COVID-19 the uh, anxiety and stress uh, are contagious and they go right through the system. We've got a, an anxiety pandemic as well as a COVID pandemic. And so I think to become aware and able to detect the state of stress of the person you're talking to, whether it be a, a senior public servant or a local government worker or a community leader or a person who's lost their house, I think is very important. That what I, what, that's what I hope we can clarify with a few ideas about recognising stress. So I'll, I'll start with really a very basic idea about stress and that is the idea that stress involves a demand that is outside our normal capacity and that stimulates our body and mind to go into overdrive, to go into an enhanced activated state. So we call this a state of heightened arousal. And I've got a diagram here which shows how the arousal process is generated at the most primitive levels of the brain and floods the brain in the first instance with adrenaline. And this really means that I'm enhanced for the stressor, for the stress situation at the expense of everything else. And therefore I'm specialised for dealing with the threat, the problem, but I'm not in a state where I can start looking beyond that. And that's what recovery really involves. A way of understanding stress is to see it as a continuum. And we can plot this on a graph. The graph here is the famous bell curve. So in the left-hand vertical axis we have performance, how well a person can perform. In the horizontal axis we have the level of arousal. And as you can see that when the level of arousal is very low, our performance is relatively low. As the arousal increases, our performance improves up to a certain point and then if arousal continues beyond that, you can't get more out of the system what you start to get is an overload, over arousal. And this is the stress zone. So we would see this uh, right shoulder, if you like, of the graph as the stress zone, going down to the trauma zone, which would be right down here towards the bottom. And then uh, at the bottom, uh, the person is dysfunctional. This is breakdown. It's probably best to call that shock, something like that. The person cannot think, make decisions. This top area we can think of as the comfort zone, the zone of optimal functioning. And if you think about it, all of our higher order intellectual, mental, emotional processes are designed to operate when we're in that comfort zone at the top of the graph. So we're hopefully in the top of the graph where we learn uh, rational thought at school to solve problems and so on. And that's the state we've got to get into. 
in order to be creative and think about our, our future. So that I think the, uh, just the ability to have that graph in the back of your mind when you're meeting with people and ask yourself, where's this person on the graph? And I'm going to show you some ways of recognising where a person is. So in the first instance, stress is caused by threat. Threat puts us into a state of heightened arousal. We'll show some pictures of that in a minute. But you don't need threat to keep you in stress. So the, the, the threat is detected by very primitive parts of our brain that make a quick and dirty assessment of the problem and switch on the, the adrenaline response or whatever it might be. They're not properly thought out, they're not reflected on and analysed, it's a quick response. You would know what that was like as if you've ever nearly trodden on a snake. You just go straight into action. And then of course you become very alert whenever you see black crooked sticks in the environment. You don't just say, yes that reminds me of the snake I nearly trod on yesterday. You actually just go straight into action. And it's this primitive mechanism that comes into play. Now, in psychology we say the process of assessment, the quick and dirty assessment, is an appraisal as opposed to a proper cognitive judgment. And so we're often seeing people making these quick and dirty judgments when they're in a state of very heightened arousal. And this appraisal may be mistaken, just like you having heart failure when you see a black crooked stick, even though it's not a snake. It's just the most general features of the outline that activates the response. Even you can sometimes have that feeling you know it's a stick but you actually can feel the reaction happening. It's like you've got two bits of your brain operating in different ways. So therefore we need to understand that the appraisal is inherently subjective and it's the personal subjective factors that determine the stress and they may be quite unrelated to the objective factors. So one thing you might want to do with people is really help them to articulate how they see it, what is their subjective appraisal of their situation, and then see if you can actually make a link with the objective features of it. But I think there's a very important additional factor, and that is research into stress shows you don't need to be under continuing threat to stay in arousal. Once you're up there, you will stay in there if you have what I call the generic arousers. These are novelty. I've never dealt with this before. Uncertainty. I don't have enough information to arrive at a definition of the situation. And conflict. Not interpersonal conflict, although that's stressful too, but I have an important decision to make and I don't have enough information to know which is the right way to go. Those are very stressful situations. Now if you look at the aftermath of a disaster after the earthquakes finished and the fires out and the floods receded and ask to what extent is there novelty, uncertainty and conflict? Well that's the extent to which people are going to remain in a highly stressed state down on the right hand end of the curve and not be in the intellectual and emotional state to do the kind of long-term planning that's uh, essential for a good recovery. So therefore we can say that uh, these features are as much determined by the social environment as they are by the physical and economic environment. And this means we can't necessarily change the physical and economic environment, but we can think about using some of the strategies that uh, Jenny so eloquently described of getting people together, of creating situations for them to think and plan and work with them. Now I want to emphasise that there are different types of stress. This is the acute stress situation, which is physiologically run by adrenaline and puts us into what I call survival mode. I'm going to show you in a moment a picture of this because I think pictures are very helpful. My definition of acute stress is I've got a massive problem and if I don't act now it's going to get worse, like a fire coming. But the continuing stress problem or the cumulative stress problem 
is a very different one. It's defined by the fact that I've got a massive problem but there's nothing I can do about it this afternoon to make it go away. It's this tension between a huge problem and the inability to actually deal with it. The example I use from ordinary life is having a mortgage. There's nothing I can do about my mortgage this afternoon except stay at work. I know this is insensitive under the current uh, circumstances. Stay at work, get up tomorrow morning and come to work and keep doing that for 25 years. And slowly but surely I might uh, w whittle away my mortgage. And that puts me in a quite different state from the survival mode. I call it endurance mode and the chemistry there is cortisol. And cortisol has quite a different effect on adrenaline. And I want to show you these two because I think what we see in the aftermath of a disaster is that people oscillate in and out of these two states. So you're in adrenaline mode, let's say with the bushfires, when the fire's on and you're rushing around and you're trying to find accommodation and sort everything out over the next few days. And then you start to settle down and think, oh my God, look at all the work I've got to do. And then you get a letter from your insurance company which says, uh, we don't think you're covered. Well, you're going to go straight back into adrenaline mode. And that's incompatible with reading your policy and s sorting out all of the complex language. Uh, so uh, then you feel uh, in despair and you move into endurance mode. Uh, what can I do about it? I've just got to endure. So it's this interplay and I think to keep track and what I want to do is compare these two states of mind so that when you're talking to people, you can pick up, first of all, if they're in those states, which one, and I'm going to offer a few strategies about how to help them move out of it and how to work with them while they're in it. First, I want to show you a picture of each of those states. Now, these are probably extreme examples, but I want to point out a few features. Uh, now. This is a scene of rescuing a woman from a cinema fire in uh, Calcutta, when it used to be called Calcutta. What I want you to focus on is this man's face. Here's the woman being carried out, but this man's face, it's the face of adrenaline. And if you look there, you can see the characteristics of this adrenaline state. You can see that he's gone into tunnel vision, a narrowed focused attention. You can see that he's oblivious of the periphery. That will mean he's highly adapted to the focus on the threat if he's focusing on the right thing. The risk is unless he's well trained and experienced, there's no guarantee he's going to focus on the right feature of the environment. That may need to be drawn to his attention. But if you look at his sense of connection with the people around him, you can see that there's a very diminished sense of connection and communication. So he's probably not responsive to someone tapping him on the shoulder and saying, I think that's the wrong way to go. He's not going to turn around and say, excuse me, I'm very busy, I haven't got time to talk to you. He's probably going to say that in four letter words. So you get this heightened responsiveness in this state. I want you to also look at the facial characteristics, actually of all of them, all of them that are in the middle of this, even this man who's carrying most of the weight. You can see a blank expressionlessness in the face. And what that shows is there's no emotion. There's arousal and energy, but no emotion. You can see emotion in this bystander on the top left-hand corner who's got no role. The rescuers have gone into action mode because they're pursuing a goal to address the threat and reduce the arousal. So there's no place for emotion. That would interfere with addressing the goal and increase more stress. So what they do is shut down. And we know that adrenaline will shut down all of the feedback systems. People don't who feel hungry or tired or thirsty until they're in a state of collapse. The adrenaline response produces endorphins that shut down pain receptors. So you can generalise and say people are unaware of their own state. Now if we were to put a brain scan on this man we'd find that his right frontal lobe is glowing brightly where he's thinking predominantly in pictures and emotions. Emotions are telling him the imperative to do it and the pictures are telling him what to do. The left side of the brain where we think in words and concepts and strategies and priorities 
is offline. We would all have had the experience of, I don't know, after a, a near miss car accident or whatever, uh, you really have a lot of trouble speaking clearly. People after bushfires have a lot of trouble filling out forms because they can't retrieve verbal information. They can't even read those insurance policies for a long time. So uh, it, we need to be aware that the person is adapted for a physical threat. But many of the threats that will activate them in the aftermath are legal, economic, uh, etc., and involve language rather than being physical. So this is a tension. When we come to the cumulative stress situation, the stresses are enduring and therefore have to be prioritised over the self. The narrowed focus continues the, the focus away from the self. In fact, the self may interfere with your ability to just keep going and plodding on in this Herculean task you've got. And so you reset your comfort zone to endure in stress zone. And, and this is part of what cortisol does. Cortisol that then uh, not uses up the reserves like in adrenaline, but draws the energy out of the tissues of our own body and builds up what I call cellular fatigue the fatigue that the person doesn't feel, but shows up in their sort of haggard grey face and their zombie-like plodding uh, state of mind. Let's have a look at it. These two people have been held hostage for six weeks by Filipino terrorists years ago. And again, you can see the blankness in the face the eyes, the intense eyes showing you that uh, bright, active focus, but there's nothing to focus on outside. There's nothing to address. They're just stuck there. So you've got this arousal which is just converted into enduring, not into achieving. And that endurance mode uh, is very likely to lapse into depression if it gets too far. That's one of the dynamics. Whereas the uh, adrenaline state is uh, likely to lapse into anxiety. Uh, and these are the two pol polar uh, poles of emotion that people oscillate between. And if we look there and, and uh, look at, there's no signaling going on between this couple. Uh, and we can see that in this cortisol state, uh, there's a degraded self-awareness, but there's also an insensitivity to, insensitivity to others, that people go into this state of shutting everything down except the bare minimum of what they have to do. We'll see this in farmers who will just go out and keep building fences, uh, in, in people in the community who just doggedly go through their stuff, uh, trying to get everything moving and uh, uh, just based on the template of what they had before and what has to be done. And so uh, this then easily creates a, a difficulty of uh, eating well, so they eat, take away food, they drink too much, they drink too much coffee, uh, and you move into this sort of lifestyle of trying to just keep the energy up, and this creates further stress and there's a whole movement into a degrading uh, what I call degraded quality of life and socially and emotionally you get the feeling I, I can't take time off to enjoy myself so I, I get a, a humorless uh, drab life. Uh, we, we see that uh, relationships come under pressure because people don't put any energy into each other. Each person feels they need more than, than they can give and, and so on. And so you get this, this uh, very dangerous state in this aftermath that uh, is, is, if we're not careful, is the state in which people have to make these very far-reaching decisions. Um, now, I'm probably stating it in a very simple black and white terms, but I think these are the things to look out for. Uh, as Jenny has so beautifully shown, some of the creativity that uh, occurred in Christchurch to cheer people up, they started a program called the All Right Program, which was uh, uh, a community-wide program just to help people just say you're all right and just to uh, address each other's emotional state. Um, these are very, very important uh, morale-raising mechanisms. 
so that we've got to get people out of these states before we can start engaging with them in long-term uh, processes. So we can summarise this by saying the core features are the, stro the focus on the stressor, which is the immediate problems, which gives us an increased capacity to respond to those problems at the expense of disruption of the feedback system, overriding fatigue, pain, etc., and putting us in a state where we'll just keep going until the reserves are all exhausted. Then we often get a serious collapse. In disasters in Australia, it's quite often observed that that will often come around about six months down the track if people are not taking care of themselves earlier. And the narrowed attention that is inseparable from heightened arousal results in this loss of information, overvaluing some details, loss of context, which leads to distorted judgments, cutting corners, and uh, the wrong priorities. I want to just, in a simple way, um, describe some of the features of uh, the thinking that happens when we're in a stressed state. We've probably all experienced this in one way or another when we've had difficult times in our own lives. The more stressed you become, the more your thinking moves from complex, abstract, uh, multifactorial thinking to more linear, concrete, simple problem-solving thinking. Less verbal, more visual, reduced flexibility and ability for lateral thinking working from simplified emotional associations rather than logical deduction. So you can see people leap from one idea to another because of the emotional connection between them rather than following a rational way of thinking through. Becoming judgmental, making snap decisions. In the disaster environment we notice a tendency to simplified notions of what's happened. So those who have lost their house deserve, deserve sympathy, those who didn't lose their house don't because they haven't got a problem even though the person who didn't lose their house stayed fought the fire thought they were going to die has a profound post-traumatic stress disorder which means they don't want to live there anymore and they can't see how to continue their life whereas the person who lost their house evacuated early didn't feel under threat at any stage and uh, just wants to get back and live in their environment and so this is a very complex set of uh, differences uh, if we're in a very stressed state we have these black and white judgments in which people say very hurtful things to each other uh, in the aftermath. In stress there is always a bias in our brain hardwired in towards focusing on and taking in and processing threat related information at the expense of reassuring information and this will uh, I think is responsible for the point that uh, Jenny mentioned earlier, which is the risk that we will rebuild and, and refocus around the disaster that's just happened, instead of actually looking at uh, all other risks, uh, whether we uh, hardwire for cars, because that's what we need in the immediate aftermath, or whether we have a holistic view of the community we want. Um, so, uh, I think it's very important that we recognise these biases. So uh, we need people to get into a state of strategic, long-term, uh, multifactorial planning. I uh, just want to say a couple of uh, comments about um, emotions. The more your arousal comes up, the more you revert to the basic primitive emotions fear, anger, distress, horror, disgust. There's just a few basically uh, universal emotions that are more or less hardwired. The emotions we really want to engage are the complex, socially constructed, meaningful emotions that help us process and move on, that hold values, regret, disappointment, sadness, compassion, resignation, uh, the qualities that lead into the future. People become highly reactive, unstable, and fluctuate, which keeps uh, the emotional instability, keeps the stress up. Or, if it's too much, they shut down and become numb and detached, 
which means they're not feeling anything, which means they're not processing it. Uh, emotions become welded to memories and therefore constantly reactivated. This is the post-traumatic situation. And unjustified emotions are stimulated by false or distorted judgments. So if I didn't lose my house, I feel guilty. People will say, I wish I'd lost my house. I wouldn't feel so bad. Uh, so we can sort of summarize by saying in endurance mode, the risk is if we're in this high st stress, we, we lose some of the higher order functions. I'm not going to read these all through. Uh, hopefully you can get access to the slides. But, but these are the things that will be put aside because endurance means I'm just in the present moment and the next moment and the next moment. If I think too far ahead, I'm going to become overwhelmed. Now what I want to do is, uh, uh, at the risk of complicating this, I want to just show you how we can see these two states and compare them. Now I'm not going to read all these points, but I want to just speak to them and uh, maybe you can look at the slides more carefully. But the overall state of, of adrenaline is this non-specific activation into active uh, goal-directed pursuit of addressing the threat. Uh, there's this huge uh, rush of energy from physiological sources and the shutting down of our uh, pain and uh, fatigue and other. It's a very powerful state versus the cortisol state which is highly dependent on psychological factors. Whether I'm trained, whether I've got a past experience, uh, whether I'm optimistic and am confident or whether I feel overwhelmed and my life's experience says I probably am never going to get through this. So these are very important factors to be addressed in order to reduce that. Research shows that this cortisol response will persist even between threat episode, where the adrenaline disappears and comes back, whereas the cortisol continues because you're worrying about the next problem coming up. Uh, and it, the, under the effect of this cortisol, a whole lot of physiological changes go on which uh, produce massive alterations in our physical functioning over time. Here's another picture of uh, the adrenaline state. Uh, this is uh, Congo peacekeepers. These two men are in, uh, uh, obviously in high adrenaline. And you can see the total focus on the threat outside. This householder here, has got a complex emotional state going on. You can see that he's very much in touch. He's got a lot of complex feelings. But this adrenaline state is very simplified. You're not going to be able to make good plans about a complex lifestyle in that state. In the next picture, we've got a couple of uh, examples of the, of the cortisol, this sort of sense of numb, zombie-like, uh, looking into the future and just not knowing how to uh, go about it. So when we think about how do people think in adrenaline, it's this rapid focus on images, bias towards the threat, simple judgments, direct problem solving about immediate issues with great efficiency, narrow focus, want to get on, get things sorted, whereas in the cortisols, they're mod methodical, persistent and so on, but holding everything in mind. People who have to rebuild their house can't sleep because they've got to hold all the details in mind because they can't afford not to think about them because they worry they'll forget them. Uh, they can think about anything that is familiar, automatic and routine, but can't deal with anything that's novel or creative or complex. Can't separate the wood from the trees. Can't decide, can't postpone complex decisions, but can't actually sort them out. Can't prioritise doggedly just deal with the next thing, can't create uh, lateral solutions to problems. Uh, again, with emotions, you've got uh, this strong emotional uh, responsiveness in the adrenaline state, whereas in the cortisol, you have a more numb, disconnected state of mind. In the adrenaline state, you get outbursts of anger. Uh, if you can't pursue your goals in adrenaline, then the arousal can't be discharged, so it feeds back and, and discharges as a simple emotional outburst, usually anger or despair, tears, uh, outbursts. In the cortisol state, you get what I just think of as inbursts, this sort of uh, 
doggedly pursuing, pursuing, finally after, uh, I don't know, waiting an hour and a half on the end of uh, uh, the Telstra line and you get someone who says they can't solve your problem, you just hang up and you just go to bed and, and uh, put the doona over your head for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, this sense of despair and de defeat. Uh, it's quite a different psychology. So uh, now I think we can hear this when we listen to the way people talk. The adrenaline person doesn't listen, they rapidly shoot out what they want, they demand action, they have a very simplistic idea, they're very egocentric, we are all egocentric in this state, we need what we want, uh, insistent, you can, it becomes suffocating, they keep talking, they never give you time to get in and as soon as you start to give them something new they keep going with the next problem they've got, uh, this, this demand to actually function, high energy uh, and very judgmental. In the cortisol state, you'll get them just coming and telling you, they say, oh, I don't know where to start, and you can say, start anywhere, and they go on and on and on, and they give you huge amounts of unnecessary detail because they can't sift and sort, they can't analyse and come to the core of the issue. Uh, they have to explain everything in detail. Uh, they show you how they've got everything in their mind and they can't deal with it. It's low energy but sustained, this zombie state I think of it as. Uh, they, they might listen to you and nod, but it doesn't go in. Uh, and next time you talk to them, they, they can remember that you talked to them, but they can't really remember what you said. Uh, and and they, they tend to be very confused and muddled. And I think these are very different states of mind. Now, I uh, just want to touch on a couple of ways in which we can work with these. With the uh, uh, acute stress, the adrenaline state, I think we've just got to listen and let the arousal go down. The way we do that is just keep inviting them to tell us their story. Uh, follow their lead. Focus on what they're interested in. And we've got to communicate them to, with them in very simple terms because they're only looking for a specific issue. We've got to address the issue they want and then as they feel as though we're helping them, then we might lead them to where we think is a more profitable way to go. We should speak in short sentences because they can't follow complex language. Uh, use images and metaphors, pictures perhaps, drawn pictures, because they're in this right side of the brain. Uh, bring in other perspectives slowly as uh, you engage them, redirect their thinking. In contrast with the cortisol state, uh, well, we have to listen to them too. And often we have to listen for a long time as they go on and on. And my experience is it doesn't help to interrupt them. They just go back to what they've got on their mind. We have to listen until eventually they might ask us a question. I think we've got to help them prioritise and plan because they usually don't know uh, where to go or what to do. Uh, and so just beginning to sketch out a very broad framework if you try to do that someone in adrenaline mode, you're not addressing their concerns, they can't take it in. But in the cortisol state, I think just giving them a bit of a sense of what's important, what we should look for first. I think it's a very useful uh, 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 strategy to think out loud with them, to think out the rational process that you would just leap over. Uh, it seems to me that if we were to do that, it would lead to this, but actually you want to go there, so that means probably it's better to do this first. What do you think? Uh, and uh, this really means uh, we have to be prepared to work through their style of thinking and in a way bring them back up the curve to their optimal state. Look for the errors in their reasoning. They will often have very strong ideas about why things can or can't be done. They'll often say, no, that can't be done, I've tried that before, or that won't work. And just invite them to explain why, and look, there'll, be, there'll probably be errors there. Uh, just a couple more points before we sort of summarise this. I think with the adrenaline state, we've got to give them confidence that we're listening to them on their terms, otherwise we lose them. They won't be asking themselves, why is this person trying to go down this track? Is that important? They'll just be saying they're not listening, they don't get it. Uh, help them to get something done. 
and that will actually give them a sense of achievement and then they might be ready for something else. Help them to try and refocus on the long term and why that's really important. Help them get off their hobby horse. Maybe the thing they're actually pursuing is actually not the most helpful. Uh, we found that uh, talking to people after the Christchurch earthquake as well as bushfires where they get absolutely fixated on something about the red zoning or the, the, the building regulations and uh, uh, they can't take in where those have come from and why they've been uh, produced and they have to do with national standards and uh, state legislation and that's why the local government person there just fo focused on that local government planner. Uh, and we need to help them slowly get the big picture in, in mind. Uh, so I think we need to help them get the confidence to take time to come out of that state. In the uh, cortisol state, we also have to give them confidence that they are communicating with us and we're on their wavelength. And hope and confidence through the quality of the communication that we can see how they might be able to achieve what they want. And again, thinking out loud. And I think that, that, that is you loan them your unstressed brain that has got access to all of those higher order functions. Help them make a plan. And uh, I would encourage them to rest, to think about things, to take things away and sleep on them and come back rather than try and just doggedly keep going. I can summarise this with uh, just a few key points in talking with stressed people. Don't try and do anything until you've reduced the tension. Because it probably won't work. The second thing is help them clarify what they've got on their mind so that you're absolutely clear what they're pursuing before you try and do anything. Then you might be in a position to suggest that there may be some options they're not looking at. Be very slow and methodical and use body language and tone of voice and a pace that keeps bringing them out of their uh, stress state. And people will say, if, even when they're yelling at us and being angry, and we just quietly say, let me see if I've got you right. You think I'm uh, not understanding you because of X, Y, and Z. If I got that right, uh, you know, they'll come down and afterwards they'll say that was so helpful that you didn't get emotional as well. Um, don't try and solve things quickly. Start a process with them. Don't use jargon, big words or complex ideas. Now the problem is in every profession our jargon is our language. We don't know what our own jargon is. It's just the language we use. And unless we talk with people who have nothing to do with that profession and look at their blank responses, we don't know when we're using technical languages. Or they may have a vague sense of what something means, but they don't really get it. So therefore, my guideline is to say, children in their development start to use concepts and abstract ideas around about the age of nine, in the middle of primary school. That's when they move from uh, sums about apples and oranges to algebra concepts A and B plus C equals D. And therefore I think a guideline is use the complexity of language and the supported thinking process you would use to explain this to an eight and a half year old intelligent, alert and interested child. We don't talk down to them and treat them like children, but we use the complexity of language that would actually convey what we mean to a, to a child of that age. And I think that's to do with the, what we now know about the inability for a stressed brain to use the higher order centres. And as their stress come down, you'll hear them. They'll start to use more complex ideas. But we need to speak in that very simple way, very slow, very methodical. Uh, use tangible references, images, metaphors and concrete experiences. Explain everything. Don't take things for granted. As adults we leap across a chain of logical reasoning 
because it's ponderous and unnecessary and boring. But I think when people are stressed, they need us to slowly step through the consequences of it. I think just a, just a couple of points to, to finish off with. Um, if we want people to understand and manage their stress, the first thing is they've got to recognise that they are stressed, which means reversing the focus from out there on the problem to in there on me. And we can help them do that by saying, it sounds like this is uh, very complex for you at the moment. Why don't you take some time, take some time off, and we'll come back and talk about it a bit more. Just do it in little steps. Try to help them recover the big picture and put their recovery in the context. You don't have to do this quickly. Uh, we know that it takes people a number of years. There's plenty of time to do it in. They probably don't feel that, but actually that's going to be inevitable. Uh, Remind them to remember what's valuable, what the important values are. Because I can say from many years' experience that how people recover doesn't depend on what happened on the day. It depends what happens over the next two years. Because they may drop everything. I could quote examples of people who drop everything and rebuild their house over six months and then help their neighbour rebuild their house over the next six months and then three years later they're divorced and they've sold everything, they're living in a flat near the airport seeing their kids once every second weekend and they ask, what happened? I thought I had a good marriage. Well, uh, any marriage is going to be in trouble if you have no time with your wife when you've uh, just been through a terrible experience and you spend a year not spending any time. Um, and so we've got to keep directing people back to those fundamental human values that's actually why they're going to have a house, uh, to have a family in it. Um, and help them break the stress cycle by prioritising rest and recreation and enjoyment. Uh, in the cortisol state, they don't exist. And we've got to say, you must do that, otherwise, towards the end, things will break down. And the simple, uh, simple recipe is pleasure and leisure. They must start holding that in place from an early stage. So um, I, I think I'll leave it there and, uh, uh, and uh, we'll make sure that these uh, slides are available so that you can uh, look at them in more detail. Thank you.